13-year-old Amy McNeil had her whole life ahead of her. But when she was kidnapped on her way to school, her future was in peril. The first call her terrified parents made was to the FBI. They hoped that the combined experience of agents and local law enforcement would flesh out the kidnappers before they took her life. Wealth has its rewards, but it also brings its dangers. Kidnapping is one of them. No ordeal is more horrifying for a family than to have a child taken. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Kidnapping cases are among the most challenging for law enforcement, who often must remain out of sight, yet close at hand, ready to move in at a moment's notice. About 20 miles south of Fort Worth, Texas, lies Alvarado, a small town in rural Johnson County. A few wealthy residents found Alvarado a safe haven away from the state's urban centers. The McNeils were among them. They lived as one of the area's most prominent families, partly from the return that Mr. McNeil made by selling an early design of the handheld calculator. At 7.15 a.m. on Friday, January 11th, 1985, they began their day having breakfast together as was their usual routine. Amy! Afterwards, their teenage son would drive himself and his 13-year-old sister, Amy, to school. Hi, darling. Hi, sweetie. Please be careful out there today. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Bye, Amy. Bye. On the way, Amy and her brothers stopped to pick up their cousin as well. He and his family lived in a separate house on the McNeil estate. At about 7.45, they were finally on their way to class. Then, from behind an abandoned truck, a sedan pulled out across the road, forcing the teenager's Jeep off to the side. A gunman jumped out of the car and approached the Jeep. He demanded that Amy get into the sedan. The blonde-haired man warned her brother not to contact the authorities. He would call the family in a short while with his demands. Instinctively, the teenager started to get out to help his sister. Leave and go home, boy! But the kidnappers threatened to kill him and his sister if he tried to follow them as they raced off with the 13-year-old. The teenagers couldn't make out the license plate. In a matter of seconds, the girl was gone. They turned around and sped home. The boys told the McNeils what had happened and repeated the kidnappers' warning not to contact the authorities. They pulled us over and they had guns. And then if you told the police that they kill her, Mr. McNeil ignored the demand and called the FBI field office in nearby Fort Worth. Give me the FBI. Former FBI Special Agent Clint Brown, a 30-year veteran, understood that when a kidnapping occurs, every second counts. Hello, uh, this is Clint Brown. I worked many kidnapping cases, okay. and uh, in right. not a single okay. case right. okay. uh, did the subject get away with it. The number one goal in all cases like this is the safe return of the victim. All uh, activities, all actions are all geared toward not doing anything to endanger the safety of the person who's been kidnapped. The FBI's first task was to set up a recorder on the family's phone. By capturing the kidnapper's voice, they hoped to identify him or the place he was calling from. The FBI also informed the local phone company to be prepared to trace any incoming calls. 
Agents instructed the father on how to handle the call. He needed to insist on proof from the kidnappers that his daughter was still alive. The fact that they had worn no disguises disturbed former Johnson County Sheriff Eddie Boggs, who called in the Texas Rangers moments after he arrived. The kidnappers hadn't tried to conceal who they were at all. They just, as we call it, they just barefaced them, just no mask, no disguises, anything. That means there's not going to be a victim around tell who they are or what they look like. Uh, they're going to kill them. Uncovering the kidnappers' identities might prevent that. Using an identikit that included hundreds of facial features, investigators worked with Amy's brother and cousin, building a composite of the man who held the shotgun. The teenagers had never seen the man with the stringy blonde hair before. They also provided a description of the kidnapper's car. It seems like the people who engage in this are people of uh, questionable and limited mental capacity. And uh, very often they have, uh, I guess what you might say, delusions based on uh, drug use. Uh, very often, you know, the need to get money to promote their drug habits are, are what drives them. And so uh, we have that being a, a motive for the kidnappings very much. And, and that uh, certainly impairs their ability to think or plan or pull this off successfully. At 10 a.m., over two hours after Amy had been abducted, the phone finally rang. Hello? It was one of her kidnappers. Yeah. Did your son tell you I had your daughter? The man demanded a $100,000 yeah. ransom. Yeah. Half was to be in $100 bills, the other half in smaller denominations. None of it could be sequenced. As instructed, Amy's father pleaded to speak to his daughter, but the kidnapper refused. Her captor insisted Amy was still alive and that her father could speak to her. When the man called back to say where to drop the ransom, he added that if the family called the FBI, they would never see Amy again. The call lasted less than a minute not long enough to establish a trace for the technology of 1985. Agents played back the recording, listening for any background noise that might reveal the location. They figured the call was likely made from a payphone since they could hear wind and traffic noise. But they heard nothing more specific. And no one in the family recognized the kidnapper's voice. Though Amy's family was wealthy, her father did not have $100,000 in cash available since most of his assets were tied up in investments. He called his associates to fly in on chartered planes with whatever cash they were able to withdraw. The next call they received was not the one retired Sheriff Eddie Boggs had hoped for. The press had learned of the kidnapping from one of McNeil's neighbors. I got a call from my chief deputy, and he said that uh, he has all sorts of media representatives uh, out there wanting a story. They knew that there had been a kidnapping, there had been a ransom demand. They demanded to talk to somebody about the story and that they were going to go on the air with it. If the kidnappers discovered that law enforcement was involved, they would likely dispose of Amy before the ransom was delivered. Investigators discussed what they should do next as precious minutes ticked by. The FBI instructed the family and the Johnson County Sheriff on how to proceed. And the FBI said, well, here's what you do. You have your chief deputy call each one of the reporters in, ask him for his ID, ask him who is the very top man at his station that he can talk to and then tell that top man we're not going to confirm whether or not you have a story but if you do have a story and you run it run it you could possibly cost the life of a little girl every local press agency agreed not to run the story until notified by the sheriff just before one o'clock in the afternoon the phone rang again Hello? Yeah, I'm the guy who got your daughter. It was the same man who had called earlier. 
on a separate line, an agent contacted the chief of security at the local phone company, who was standing by, hoping to trace the call. Yeah. He trapped the number yeah, and began to track right its origin. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. McNeil begged the kidnapper to let him hear his daughter's voice. This time, the man allowed the frightened girl to speak to her father. Her eyes concealed to prevent her from knowing where she was. Don't hurt me. Be my girl. He could hear her crying. Despite his own fear, he reassured Amy that everything would be okay and that she would soon be home. That's when the man grabbed the phone. The kidnapper said that he had not yet secured a location for the ransom to be dropped. What do you mean you're having trouble getting a drop zone? Again, he promised to call back later. Hello? The room fell silent, as former Texas Ranger Bill Gunn recalls. It was very heartrending to listen to it. She was frightened. Uh, and of course, Mr. McNeil was frightened. The conversation was very short. Mr. McNeil encouraged her to uh, keep her upper lip up and re remember who she was. And that was the end of the conversation. They hoped the trace would be successful. The security chief reported that the call had originated from outside the phone company's calling area. And since the call had been terminated, it would be impossible to trace it through the neighboring system. The phone company was able to determine that the call was made from somewhere in the town of Kennedale, 25 miles north of the McNeil's estate. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Good. Texas. Amy was still in Texas, close to Fort Worth. Kennedale? Okay, same But without a specific Kennedale location, investigators had little to go on. You know she's in Texas. Yeah. We had no idea, no evidence, no, no leads, nowhere to go. The only thing we had was the description of a car. Uh, I did have my troops, what few I had, to go out and start in a perimeter, uh, expanding the perimeter, checking every farm, every house, every housing addition, everywhere they could for a car that matched the description that we had. Johnson County deputies fanned out over a 30-mile radius from Alvarado up to Kennedale, searching for the kidnapper's car. They also alerted other local officers to be on the lookout for the four-door sedan. Yet without a license plate, it was not likely they'd locate the vehicle among the rural expanse. Almost six hours after 13-year-old Amy McNeil had been abducted, her father's friends from Texas and Arkansas had begun to arrive in Alvarado, carrying tens of thousands in cash. Texas Rangers escorted them from a small airport to a local bank where the currency would be processed before it was paid to the kidnappers. Wearing latex gloves, Rangers recorded and bundled the $100,000 ransom. They assembled half of it in $100 bills, as the kidnapper had instructed. Another $50,000 was compiled from smaller denominations. Retired Texas Ranger Sergeant John Dendy helped direct the processing. They had quite a time raising that amount of money on such short notice. But after, after they got the money, then uh, the Rangers that were at the bank started to uh, get in clean bags to put it in. In other words, no, no fingerprints, plastic bags, and uh, made copies of the bills. So we'd have the serial numbers on each bill. Everything was loaded up, and then all we had to do then was sit and wait until more demands came in. In the late afternoon, deputies had located a car that fit the description of the kidnapper's vehicle, parked 20 miles from the McNeil's estate. 
A license plate check revealed that the sedan had been stolen the day before from Mesquite, Texas, 50 miles east of Alvarado. Inside, deputies found no obvious signs of Amy or her abductors. They impounded the car and continued to canvass the area for witnesses who may have seen the driver. At the Johnson County Sheriff's Department, the FBI processed the sedan for forensic evidence. From the interior, they removed several sets of fingerprints. But without a suspect's prints to compare them to, the recovered prints could not help identify Amy's captors or their current whereabouts. By 11.30 p.m., 16 hours after Amy had been taken, her family had received three more phone calls, but still had not been told where the ransom was to be dropped. They hoped this would be the call that could secure Amy's release. Hello? It was the same man who had called earlier. Yeah. Once again, the phone company initiated yeah. a trace. Yeah, I'm working on it right now. Amy's father told the kidnapper that he had the $100,000 prepared as the man had requested. No, I don't want to do this tomorrow. But the well, caller said that it was too late. The ransom drop he had in mind was at least 200 miles away from Alvarado. By the time Mr. McNeil reached the location, it would be light, too risky for the kidnapper to take a chance on being seen. The father pleaded to make the exchange tonight. The man refused. He said he'd call back tomorrow to make the arrangements. We didn't think they would uh, let us have her back alive you know, in, in good shape. We, we had no idea what they'd done to her in this period of time that they'd had her. Agents waited for word to see if the trace had been successful. Yeah. No, what long enough? It had not. No. Once again, the phone okay. company had failed to secure the kidnapper's location. Investigators could only hope that 13-year-old Amy McNeil would survive the night and eventually be reunited with her parents. By 5 p.m. on Saturday, January 12, 1985, a day and a half had passed since 13-year-old Amy McNeil had been kidnapped on her way to school in Alvarado, Texas. One of several unidentified kidnappers had called Amy's wealthy family seven times he demanded $100,000 in unsequenced currency, but had not told the McNeils where to drop the ransom. Though the kidnapper had also warned Amy's family not to call the FBI, Mr. McNeil had done so and was joined by several hey guys, agents, a dozen Texas Rangers, and the Johnson County Sheriff's Department. Her abductors had promised to call again at 5 p.m. with the location of the ransom exchange and to confirm that Amy remained unharmed. Despite the agonizing wait, former Special Agent Clint Brown and his team wasted no time in preparing. When the instructions uh, were anticipated, a plan was devised to deliver the ransom money with uh, Mr. McNeil uh, driving the car and carrying the money uh, himself for delivery so that anybody would see the car. It was the limousine that, that he had they would assume he was in the car by himself. Actually concealed in the car would be two FBI agents. The agents also outfitted Mr. McNeil with a mini cassette device to record any conversations he may have with the kidnappers if they should approach his limousine. The interior of the car would be wired as well, and the two concealed agents would be heavily armed. At 5.10 p.m., the kidnapper called again. He told Mr. McNeil to drive 40 miles, alone in his limousine, from Alvarado on Interstate 30 to East Dallas, and take exit 51. There he would find a gas station. The father was to be there by 7 p.m. in order to receive further instructions on the payphone by the vending machine. 
Mr. McNeil spoke to Amy briefly before her abductor disconnected. She was scared, but unharmed. The call was too brief to be traced. As planned, a contingent of FBI, Texas Rangers, and Johnson County personnel would follow McNeil's car at a distance. The team would be fully equipped, as retired Texas Ranger Bill Gunn remembers. We got all of the assets available, uh, tracking devices, uh, aircraft. Uh, we had a tracking device on Mr. McNeil's car so that if we lost contact with it on the ground, both aircraft could receive it. Amy's father promised his wife that he wouldn't come home without their daughter. He was fitted with body armor and provided with a sidearm in the event the kidnappers attacked him. The two agents with him would be armed with shotguns and semi-automatic pistols. They checked their radios to make sure they could be heard by the follow team. Okay. You guys okay back there? Check one, check two. Retired FBI Special Agent Rod Kicklighter was assigned to ride in the limousine and advise the concerned father. I recall one of our uh, main instructions to him was uh, not to let himself uh, be taken hostage. And uh, we talked through that quite a bit. Uh, he was to deliver the money, and we would then take over, try to effect the arrest, but he was uh, in no way to uh, get involved himself. McNeil got the go-ahead to leave for the gas station in East Dallas, 40 miles away. When the limo had reached about a mile, the agent instructed the others to follow. Since the kidnapper had provided a specific route to the Dallas gas station, former Ranger Sergeant John Dendy and the others feared that the kidnappers could be surveilling the limousine as it traveled. We had no idea where they would be, who they were, or what they were in, or anything about them. And uh, in order for them not to become uh, suspicious of any of us, we kept a, a good distance behind, behind the car. As the stretch crossed county lines, the rangers radioed ahead to local authorities. They informed traffic patrols not to stop the speeding unmarked cars and provided license plates for their vehicles. Several units raced ahead to set up surveillance of the service station in East Dallas. While most maintained an outside perimeter, one team held a distant view of the payphone. They stood by, ready to act, in the event that the kidnappers revealed themselves or their 13-year-old hostage. Agents reported that the limousine had just reached exit 51. The phone had begun ringing at exactly 7 p.m when Amy's father rolled into the service station. What? Okay, hold on, hold on. It was the eighth call he had okay. received from his daughter's kidnappers over the past 34 hours. The man did not give the father the news he had hoped for. He told Mr. McNeil to take Interstate 20 east to Tyler, Texas, almost 100 miles from Dallas. At the US 69 exit, he would find another gas station where he'd receive another call at 9.20 on the payphone outside. For retired Special Agent Clint Brown, it was difficult to predict what Amy's abductors might be planning. We could tell the kidnappers uh, were not very well organized. They uh, seemed somewhat uh, ill at ease, confused. Uh, uh, some of their plans seemed to change. They didn't seem to have a clear idea of uh, uh, where the money was to be delivered, and so it even appeared to be stalling at times, uh, trying to uh, formulate a workable plan that they thought they could use. So it did not appear that they had uh, thought this out very well at all. At the second gas station in Tyler, 
Amy's father was directed to drive to a third one in Longview, 40 miles further east, by 11 p.m. From there, he was ordered to drive 60 more miles north to a fourth gas station in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Precisely at midnight, he'd receive another call at the payphone outside. By now, investigators had covered over 180 miles, traveling for well over five and a half hours. They hadn't anticipated the long trip, and two surveillance aircraft were forced to turn back to refuel in Dallas. Despite their frustrations, the team was determined to outlast the kidnappers. We had no idea what they were going to do next. They just kept running us over East Texas. We, we saw a large portion of East Texas, and we didn't know when it was going to stop. But we knew that we were there for the duration. But the situation was only getting worse. About halfway to the Mount Pleasant gas station, the limousine began losing power. After racing at speeds in excess of 100 miles an hour for extended periods, the engine simply quit. Agent Kicklighter feared that the mechanical problem would jeopardize any chance they may have still had to rescue the 13-year-old. We're all getting uh, a little tense and excited and uh, worried that we're not going to get to the drop site and that we're not going to be able to get Amy back. Dozens of miles away at the gas station in Mount Pleasant, two camouflaged Texas Ranger snipers had been deployed to surveil the payphone. At midnight, it began to ring. Mr. McNeil was the only one who could answer. But he missed the call. At midnight on January 13th, 1985, just outside Mount Pleasant, Texas, two FBI agents and the wealthy father of a kidnapped 13-year-old girl worked frantically to repair a limousine's engine. Mr. McNeil's limousine was the car his daughter's kidnappers expected right him to be driving alone right to okay. a Mount Pleasant gas station payphone by midnight. As Mr. McNeil tried to restart his car, two camouflaged Texas Ranger snipers deployed to surveil the gas station watched helplessly as the phone began ringing. Mr. McNeil was the only one who could answer but he missed the call for the final location of the $100,000 ransom exchange. Patrolling the desolate roads around the gas station in Mount Pleasant, the support team was informed that Mr. McNeil had finally found his car's difficulty, according to former FBI Special Agent Clint Brown. The car that Mr. McNeil was riding in began to develop uh, electrical problems. Apparently, the uh, alternator wasn't keeping the battery charged up, and so as time went on, the lights began to dim, and he began to have um, trouble with the electrical system of the car. The communications and tracking devices wired to the limo system had drained its power over the past seven hours. Disconnecting several instruments provided enough juice to get the engine started again. Though the headlights were inoperable, the car would move forward. Mr. McNeil and the two agents pressed on without full power and limited visibility. Their path was lit by an aircraft overhead. The remaining FBI agents, Texas Rangers and Johnson County personnel, gathered at a separate filling station a short distance from where the kidnappers had planned to call. They debated what to do next, since Mr. McNeil had missed the midnight appointment and they had no way of contacting the kidnappers. With few options, investigators decided to send the limousine to the Mount Pleasant gas station late, figuring that the kidnappers would probably call again. We were uh, pretty well counting on the fact that they were going to show up or call, that you know, they were desperate for the money. Uh, we reassured them we had the money and we certainly reassured them we wanted Amy back. So uh, we thought that they would stay 
stay uh, connected to uh, follow through with the payoff site. At approximately 1 a.m., Mr. McNeil and the FBI agents arrived at the Mount Pleasant gas station in the troubled limousine. Almost eight hours and 200 miles after they had first departed Alvarado, the limousine's engine gave out for good. The vehicle wasn't going anywhere without major repair. They could do nothing more but wait in the chilly night and pray that the kidnappers would contact them. Due to the fact that we had to uh, drive very slowly in the limousine, we were, uh, we were late getting to the drop site uh, approximately uh, an hour. Uh, we were somewhat concerned about that, but uh, we set up uh, to wait uh, by the drop site. Texas Rangers kept watch, remaining hidden in the field across from the gas station. The fate of 13-year-old Amy McNeil remained unknown. Then, at 1.15 in the morning, the payphone started ringing. As investigators had suspected, one of the kidnappers called back, eager to get the ransom. He claimed that Amy was still alive, but refused to let her speak. Worse still, Former Texas Ranger Bill Gunn and his team learned that the assailants had likely spotted the heavy presence of law enforcement on the desolate roads. They started out telling him that he had brought the police with him and they were very unhappy with that. So they finally told him to bring the money to a motel in Mount Pleasant. And at that time he informed the man, the kidnapper, that he could not move the vehicle again. It was dead. And the man told him on the phone then, they said, well, we're coming after the money, and we've got plenty of guns, and there better not be any police officers around. The father remained resolute, despite his fear of what the kidnappers may have already done to his daughter. He grabbed the ransom bag and stood outside so his daughter's captors could see him as they approached. Agents hidden in the limousine readied themselves for an armed confrontation. Retired Special Agent Kicklighter realized a mistake now could cost lives. The exchange of a ransom during a kidnapping is always the, uh, one of the most critical elements of the investigation. In this case, you don't want uh, someone else uh, to be hurt uh, or taken hostage and uh, be a, another victim of a kidnapping. Hours passed in the cold January night. The Rangers stayed alert, protecting against an ambush. On the road circling the gas station, investigators saw no sign of vehicles approaching the ransom drop. See anything out here? Uh, By three in the morning, Two hours after the kidnappers had called, it looked as if they weren't going to show. The Texas Rangers, Johnson County deputies, and the FBI considered what their next move should be. It was decided that it, they were not going to come, and so the whole uh, surveillance and uh, uh, monitoring situation was called off in anticipation we're going to have to start again the next day on Sunday. Agents in the limo received word of the decision to regroup until daybreak. Mr. McNeil insisted they stay. But investigators convinced him that at present, there was nothing more they could do for his daughter. Mr. McNeil was upset that uh, yet another night was going to pass without a resolution to getting his daughter back. Uh, he had done everything that they had told him to do, so there was a great deal of disappointment. A car came by to pick up McNeil and the agents. They headed back to the nearby gas station where others had begun to assemble. The two rangers hiding in the field for the past three hours moved toward the street where the sheriff was to meet them in a separate van. As they approached, an unidentified vehicle cruised by their position. 
It was filled with a group of men and a young girl who headed towards the interstate. Buick southbound. Harry the Rangers Buick called for units. Location. Need somebody to pick them up. As the they top. watched those believed to be the kidnappers speed off into the cold Texas night. At 3.45 a.m. on January 13, 1985, two Texas Rangers believed they had spotted the kidnappers of 13-year-old Amy McNeil racing away from the ransom drop point in Mount Pleasant, Texas. Hey, copy me, Mantle, copy. They alerted all available Field, units in the area. En route to collect the Rangers, the Johnson County Sheriff heard their call and saw the suspicious vehicle on the highway. He gave chase, but the sedan easily pulled away from the lumbering van that former Sheriff Eddie Boggs was driving. My van being as slow as it was, they outran me like I was standing still. There wasn't any way I could keep up in, even within sight of what was going on. Because that chase was going over 100 miles an hour, and they were, they were, it was unbelievable. Despite his best efforts, the sheriff lost the car and returned to the makeshift command post to provide a detailed account. Amy's life was now in even greater jeopardy since there was no question the kidnappers knew law enforcement was in the area. Then a call came in from their remaining aircraft. The pilot had spotted the vehicle and investigators still on the road had resumed the chase. Former Texas Ranger Bill Gunn recalls that the suspects were speeding west on Interstate 30. But at that time, the rest of us were, had gotten involved, and we were in pursuit of the vehicle. And we continued at a high-speed chase down Interstate 30, to a, which would have been a direction going toward Dallas and to a, a small community in another county. Ten minutes later, Texas Rangers, Sheriff Deputies, and the FBI fell into line. The suspects refused to slow down. As the lead ranger began to close in, he was fired upon. A shotgun and pistol pelted his car with rounds. As he prepared to return fire, he glimpsed two girls in the back seat. One was young Amy McNeil, who they were forcing into the back window. The people who were responsible for this started firing guns at them out the back windows on each side of the Buick. They would push Amy up into the back glass where they, she could be seen, and of course we couldn't return any fire. Construction narrowed the interstate to one lane, but the suspects did not slow. Shots hit the grill of the lead car. Slugs pierced the carburetor, forcing the ranger to stop. The chase continued at high speeds through three Texas counties before the suspects exited into the small town of Saltillo, Texas. Uh, dispatch, uh, looks like we're slowing down. Unexpectedly, at about 4 a.m., they stopped on the front lawn of a home, and several fled on foot. They opened fire on investigators. Two gunmen barricaded themselves behind a van parked in the driveway, while a third disappeared behind the house. None of the officers on the scene were wearing body armor. Well, first got out of the car, I could see this man standing in front of the van. Now, this is Sunday morning at 4 o'clock, and no moon, as far as I can remember. And uh, every time he'd pull off around with that 12-gauge, he'd line up the girl. Investigators took cover behind their vehicles and pinned the gunman down. The suspect's abandoned car was in the direct line of fire. Amy was trapped inside without any means of escape. One assailant attempted to break into the home of an elderly resident. She took cover, not knowing what was happening a few feet from where she had slept. As the firefight raged on, 
Investigators knew that they had to somehow get to Amy McNeil before it was too late. At 4 a.m. on January 13, 1985, the FBI, Texas Rangers, and Johnson County Sheriffs exchanged gunfire with the kidnappers of 13-year-old Amy McNeil. After being held for almost two days, Amy remained trapped inside her captor's vehicle with a female assailant on the front lawn of a farmhouse in Saltillo, Texas. Ranger Sergeant John Dendy was one of several who braved the hail of bullets. I could see one of them behind the front wheel of the car, and that's what I was mainly shooting at. I didn't have any other place to go. And the only thing I knew to do is just shut them down. And the only way I'm going to do that is to hit one of them. Several miles away in another vehicle, Amy's wealthy father was accompanied by the Johnson County Sheriff and an FBI agent on their way to the scene. They could do nothing more but hope and pray that the 13-year-old would survive the battle. Here. Go ahead. As the shooting continued, a Johnson County Sheriff's deputy moved towards the suspect's car, as Ranger Bill Gunn recalls. One deputy sheriff ran from the vehicle that he arrived in over to the kidnapper's vehicle, and she asked him if he was a police officer, and he said, yes, ma'am, and she just really grabbed hold of him then and hung on. The deputy handed the frightened girl to a ranger who took her out of harm's way. They ran back to the road where more backup arrived. After 44 hours in captivity, 13-year-old Amy McNeil was finally safe. The ranger needed to contact the other investigators and to tell her father the good news. Retired FBI Special Agent Rod Kiglider was in the vehicle as the ranger's call came through. It seemed like hours before we finally got the confirmation that uh, Amy was safe. I recall Mr. McNeil uh, beating me about the head and shoulders about uh, Amy being safe and they've got her and he was, he was ecstatic, as were we all. Hold your fire! Hold your fire! While Amy was headed to meet her father, the shooting had subsided. The gunmen had both been wounded. Investigators held their weapons on them not sure if the suspect still had ammunition. Then, out of the shadows, a third gunman emerged. Freeze, get in, get on your knees, get on your knees, stop the weapon. Realizing that escape was impossible, he surrendered. From inside the kidnapper's car, investigators cuffed the female suspect and a fourth man who had remained there during the shootout. Rangers confirmed with Amy that all the kidnappers were now in custody. On a deserted highway a mile away, Amy ran towards the waiting van that held Mr. McNeil. Dad. Dad. Former Special Agent Clint Brown watched the reunion between father and daughter. Everybody was pretty emotional. You know, we all had kids and daughters and such, so we were pretty... Uh pretty emotional just watching that reunion and, and everyone was so happy that it had turned out so well that we all shared in that uh, excitement and joy of her being recovered safely. No one but the suspects had been hit by gunfire. Both were ex-convicts and high on methamphetamine at the time of the shooting. The elderly resident was also examined. She had survived the ordeal with only frayed nerves. A license plate check on the kidnapper's car revealed that it had been stolen in Dallas the day before. Investigators also figured out why the suspects had stopped their vehicle when they had. We never could understand why they turned in at this particular house, but we found out later they'd run out of gasoline. 34-year-old James Foote, who had made the initial ransom calls, had previously worked for Mr. McNeil 
and had hatched the plan to kidnap Amy. For using a weapon in the commission of the crime, he was convicted of aggravated kidnapping and attempted murder and was sentenced to life in prison. 27-year-old Michael Mills, who had made the remaining calls, was likewise convicted of aggravated kidnapping and attempted murder, receiving life. The other assailants, 21-year-old Daniel Neckar Jr. and 21-year-old Thomas Barnes, were convicted of the same charges and also sentenced to life. The 18-year-old woman who was with them was charged as the men were. She had only met James Foote a few days earlier before the kidnapping had occurred. The woman was scared when the men brought the 13-year-old into the house, but stayed to prevent Amy from being abused by them. Amy later confirmed that the 18-year-old had protected her, according to retired Johnson County Sheriff Eddie Boggs. She was only given a 10-year probated sentence per Amy's request, the female accomplice really didn't know what she was getting into at the time whenever she joined them because this they had already been using dope for several days steady before she got involved in it and it was just a uh, she got involved in something she couldn't get out of six months later on july 4th 1985 foot was transferred from the state penitentiary to the johnson county jail to face additional charges Authorities had traced the weapons he used in the kidnapping to the armed home invasion of a Dallas man. Foote was also indicted in Arlington, where he had attempted to kidnap the child of a wealthy developer days before he took Amy. Outside, in the blistering Texas summer, the prison guard agreed to retrieve a water hose to cool down the inmates. When he left, Foote climbed over the eight-foot fence he made it under the barbed wire. Seconds later, the kidnapper disappeared into the nearby woods. That evening, the Johnson County Sheriff faced the difficult task of informing Mr. McNeil that his daughter's kidnapper had escaped to where no one knew. Deputies would be stationed outside the McNeil home as long as Foote remained at large, fearing that the convict might seek vengeance on the family. Mr. McNeil immediately offered a reward for any information leading to Foote's recapture. A few days later, a call came in to Sheriff Boggs that seemed promising. James Foote had a cousin that lived up close to Paris, Texas, that called in and said that he knew where he was and had been in contact with him. And uh, that cousin also had some criminal charges pending on him and was willing to make a deal. Okay, guys, we're going to be entering... Foote had been hiding in the cousin's Paris, here. Texas home, 170 miles northwest the of the prison. Gain access to the property. Johnson County deputies prepared for the here. assault of the single-story dwelling. Over here. This is your living room area they here. readied themselves for another armed right confrontation. As promised, the cousin made certain that Foote was inside at home for the arrest to take place. Deputy Sheriff, freeze! Get your hand up, your This hands. time, there would be no shootout. Sheriff deputies captured Foote without incident. He was returned to prison, where Foote will spend the rest of his life. At the state capitol in Austin, Texas, Retired Ranger Sergeant John Dendy was among those who received commendation and recognition for the successful conclusion to the case. Going to Austin, talking to the governor, getting a commendation. The fact that I knew that I had had something to do with saving this beautiful little girl's life was worth more than anything else they could do. That made everything worthwhile. All the 36 years that I spent in law enforcement, that, that, was the, that was the top. Because law enforcement responded quickly and did not relent, Amy McNeil was reunited with her family and friends, thankful for the determined officers and agents who answered the call.